All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to uh, Ask the Agronomist. Lance Tarchione here with you. Uh, Adam in studio with us here this morning. Uh, appreciate the uh, the folks at Nutri and Macomb for allowing us to use their uh, uh, luxurious conference room as usual for, for our broadcast. Uh, got a jam-packed agenda uh, today and hopefully uh, improved by your questions. So uh, if you're joining us in the chat, uh, you you know what to do. Log in with your, uh, either log into your YouTube account if you've got one. Uh, if not, you can log in with any Gmail email account and uh, or Google email account and you can uh, text chat in questions. So Adam and I have got uh, got some pictures we're going to hopefully show uh, today. I've got some uh, some plant samples and and trying to uh, enhance things a little bit with with some more visuals. We've gotten good feedback on the visuals that we've done before. Adam, Adam is adjusting our lights here. We uh, we get some glare when we uh, when we don't do that. So uh, anyway, hopefully uh, we'll have a, uh, a good conversation here this morning. Like I say, there's uh, there's no shortage of things to talk about. When uh, when I started doing this, uh, what, about a year and a half ago now, I, I got some feedback that people thought every two weeks would be too often because you know, there wouldn't be enough content to uh, to talk about. And uh, that has not uh, proven to be an issue yet. So there's always uh, always things to, to talk about. And, and I'm very excited about a trend I'm seeing. I'm, I'm getting viewers sending me pictures of things uh, to share and ask about and talk about, which is, which is awesome and very cool. And I really encourage that. So uh, if you've got my email, if you've got my, well, actually, I'll put it up here on the board for those of you that don't have my email. It's just my name. Oh, there's the motion sensor again. At bear.com. And cell phone number is 309-333-6733. So, so if you ever do want to, uh, to suggest some content for Ask the Agronomist, because uh, your idea of what we should be talking about Probably better be better than my idea of what we should be talking about. You can email me at that email address or text me uh, at, uh, at that cell number. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started here this morning. And please, uh, Adam, interrupt me if we get a question coming in. So um, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll show off my water hemp tree that I brought with me this morning. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a bit. But, uh, you know, obviously there's been lots of talk about soybean weed control and the challenges. We've, we've touched on this topic uh, many times on Ask the Agronomist. And with, you know, cutoff dates, label restrictions, neighbor issues, you know, strong opinions on, on both sides of, you know, what the best soybean system is. And, um, you know, people, you know, some people doing what they want, some people choosing not to do what they want just to get along with somebody else. Uh, you know, and there's lots of varying opinions uh, out in the marketplace of what the what the right thing to do is, but obviously we have we have lots of things that we need to manage through when it comes to soybean weed control. But but the reality is, regardless of what system you choose, uh, we our, our post-emergence products really need the help of of good soil residual, uh, suppressing that weed growth and giving us, you know, in in a good year, maybe eighty five or ninety percent of your weeds can be controlled pre, and so you don't have to control a post. And, and then the trick to successful post-emergence control these days is, is additionally you know, to spray early with additional residual in that post-emergence trip targeting small weeds. And, and I think we've got a lot of education that, uh, that, we, that we still need to do. And there's some confusing messages in the marketplace. And, and some people are talking about it's better to wait, let more weeds come up. That's kind of more of a, you know, what I would call an old fashioned roundup uh, mentality. Uh, back from the Roundup Ready days when all you needed was Roundup and all you had to do was let the weeds come up and then go kill them. And if they were bigger, you just used more Roundup and, and things were fairly simple. And, and obviously, fast forward to today, that, that strategy doesn't work anymore. And, and that strategy that used to work with that system uh, will not work with any of the systems on the market today. So, you know, I think in a lot of cases, you, you feel pressured to maybe spray your beans too early. Um, but I, I continue to argue that what feels too early 
is actually probably just right. And what feels right is probably about two weeks too late in, in many cases. So I, I encourage you to, you know, be a little uncomfortable when you're making those post emergence applications because you're afraid the beans are too small and the weeds are too small and not all the weeds are up yet. If you're having those thoughts going through your mind when you're spraying your beans post, regardless of what system you're on, you're, you're on the right track. And so that that's kind of my, my overall weed control message. Uh, we, we are starting to see separation uh, between products and between systems. Uh, as we've gotten hot and dry in areas, we're extremely dry still in some parts of, of central Illinois. Um, killing drought stressed weeds is a challenge for any herbicide. Killing big drought stress weeds is more than a challenge for some products. It becomes impossible for some products. And, and really, I, I've said this before, and, and I'm not saying this because I'm an old Monsanto guy and I love Roundup. The, the, the only herbicide that was ever truly good at killing big weeds was glyphosate. And it still is good at killing big weeds if they're not resistant. However, in the case of water hemp, mare's tail, um, which are two of our most problematic weeds, um, you know, Roundup is not going to give you control of those weeds. And if we let those species in particular get big, uh, we, we don't really have anything to save you uh, at, at that point. So as I drive around looking at field after field after field with, you know, this is this is a bit of an extreme case, although, you know, I, I'd say there's a lot more of this than 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 I expected to see, frankly. But if you notice, this side of this plant has been sprayed. So th this plant came from the edge of the field and, and we didn't get the sprayer quite clear out to the edge. And so it's a, it's a good illustration of glufosinate or Liberty being a contact herbicide. So we did a good job killing the leaves that we contacted. We're having no effect whatsoever on the other side of the plant. The growth of this plant has not even slowed down because of the little bit of burn that occurred on this side of the plant. So, so we talk about coverage being critical with a contact herbicide. So that is some impressive coverage. Uh, whoever sprayed this field probably used at least 20 gallon of water to the acre, maybe 25. They had the right rate. They had good coverage. They had a good sprayer set up. The only thing they didn't have was a weed small enough to kill with glufosinate. So, so that's about as good a job as you can do on a big water hemp with a contact herbicide like Liberty. However, the problem is there's about a thousand growing points all up and down the stem of this plant with axillary buds that are already starting to grow. So when you've got a stem that's that big, a root that's that big, you, you can't kill that with a contact herbicide. Now, if you keep spraying it about every two weeks, um, you, you will probably eventually kill that plant. But but the challenge we have is, and, and this I'll get up on a little bit of a soapbox, and, and, um, and I still need to build that 340-pound soapbox, Adam, that, uh, that can support me. I got one but, tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, I, I get frustrated that it, it feels some days like I'm representing the only herbicide that people think the label has to be followed. Uh, and, and that would be dicamba. Um, with all post-emergent soybean herbicides, they all have a growth uh, limitation on the crop. And in the case of dicamba, Liberty and 2,4-D, that growth stage restriction would be R1. Uh, we are past the summer solstice. And unless you planted soybeans really late, virtually every soybean in central Illinois is blooming. A lot of the early planted beans would probably be at the R2 stage. And so technically speaking, not technically speaking, legally speaking, um, all of the post-emergent soybean herbicides which are being used today with the exception of Roundup, which is labeled through R2, uh, would, would be off label at this point. So you really can't legally keep going out and respraying this field to try to take out these, these big water hemp plants. 
So, so we, we get that there are certainly challenges. Um, and, and let's say you want to blame the June 20th cutoff date. Dicamba wouldn't kill this water hemp plant either. Uh, it would be your best shot to kill this water hemp plant. But you, you would have to be really, really, really lucky to kill this with an application of dicamba. So even if you could have sprayed dicamba after June 20th, or even if you could have sprayed dicamba on a day when it was too hot, um, you still wouldn't have killed this water hemp plant. So the, 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 the solution is we got to get to these weeds when they're smaller. Whether you're using dicamba, whether you're using 2,4-D, whether you're using Liberty, whether you're using some combination of the above, um, we've got to get water hemp plants. You know, we're shooting for two to four inches with the ExtendFlex system. And a two to four inch water hemp can easily be, be controlled by dicamba, Liberty, or 2,4-D. Uh, all three systems will work really, really well on small weeds. All three systems require the use of residual post-emergence that will allow you to make that post-emergence application early enough that you can control the weeds and still have season-long weed control. So that, that that's my that's my weed control message, not not just for you know our growers that are using the ExtendFlex system, but for soybean growers in, in general. We all have to adopt that, you know, spray early, spray small weeds. We'll spray again if we have to, and sometimes we will. The, re the reality is, you know, it's a long growing season, especially when you're planting your soybeans in early April. And to expect to always get by with one post-emergence trip is unrealistic. If you can't control big weeds, which we can't, and you have to go early, which we do, there are times when you're going to post your beans twice. That's just the reality. And, and you, you know, will have limited options on what you can use on that second post-emergence pass. And it's going to cost you more than you would like to keep that field of beans clean. But that's just the, the world that we're in today. You know, maybe a technology will come out in the future that, that changes that. I don't know if it will or not. Maybe we'll all just get used to that as the, the new normal of soybean wheat control. But, you know, the reality is um, we, we need earlier, we need residuals, we need earlier applications, we need to target smaller weeds, and, and we need to look at these fields closely after that first post, first post emergence application to scout, look at how good we did, see if there's another flush coming on, and that would give us time to make another post emergence application before we're off label with everything. Um, if, if you wait until you see the weeds coming up through the beans to respray, uh, A, the weed's probably too big to kill at that point, and B, you're probably off label for whatever you're going to use. So, so I've always argued that, you know, in today's era, I don't really care to scout the field before I spray because I know what I'm going to do, and I don't need to scout the field to know what I'm going to do. I need to scout the field a week to 10 days after I spray to find out if I need to spray again rather than waiting for the weeds to get big enough that I can see them from the road. And then I'm calling somebody in August said, Hey, I need to respray my beans. And, and when you ask somebody to respray your beans in July or August, just be aware you're asking them to break the law because there's nothing they can legally spray at that time to, to control the weed. So, so don't ask your retail dealer to break the law. Any questions coming in, Adam? Tons, actually. Or maybe just complaints. No, Shut the no, hell up about weeds already. Got, got a, actually, none of the questions are about weeds. I think that was a, a okay. conversation, Lance. Okay. And uh, maybe it'll spur some more herbicide conversation. But we're getting a lot of questions coming in about fungicide, of course. Okay, Tends good. Tends the season good. to start thinking yep. about fungicide. I had that on my list. Yep, it's on your list. We're getting questions from Jordan. We're getting questions from Drew. Um about timings and rates. those two guys are probably in the same place watching it together. Yeah, they don't need to be asking separate <laughs> questions. They could be, but they're going to credit for it anyway. I tease because I love guys. <laughs> so um, I think a couple things we need to hit. First and foremost, we need to know how to properly grow stage soybean in particular to make sure we're, we're getting yeah. the grow stage timing down that we want to make the best application of fungicide. So. I've got questions about let's make sure we know what stage we need to spray, not only just soybean, but also yeah. corn. 
And then if we need to make multiple applications, what do yeah. you think about those rates and, okay. and those right. times? So, so, so b b big, big topic there. Lots of different ways we could go. It reminds me of a conversation I had yesterday. I, I, I had a, we were just talking about weeds. So I'm going to take us back to weeds just for a minute. I had a guy that called me and said, hey, my applicator has asked me if I want to spray my fungicide early because my field needs another shot of Liberty. And can I combine the fungicide and the herbicide together to save a trip? So there are situations where saving a trip does not negatively impact what you're doing. Most of the time it does. And I would say most of the time, I would rather not try to merge two different things together to save a trip. Because generally when you're doing that, you're messing up the timing on one or both of those products. So we just talked about how we cannot continue to wait on weed control. Weed control, we're already behind the eight ball on weed control. So if you got a field that needs sprayed for weeds, that's got to be done. The target window for soybean fungicide is, broadly speaking, is R2 to R4. And, and that is a huge window. I mean, that's probably at least six weeks of our summer going from early R2 to late R4. R3 is the sweet spot, which is in the middle of that. So <clears throat> it is hard to distinguish between late R2 and early R, you know, early R3 or, or late R3 and early R4. And as the soybean plant continues to grow, and put out new pods at the top of the plant. I've seen soybeans that stay at what I would call R3 for a month. So, so these, these reproductive stages in soybeans, if the soybean plant continues to grow, <clears throat> the way we stage soybeans, which this was another question. Yeah, we need to make sure we go through that. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> you need to look at the top of the plant. So you got your trifoliates, should have brought out a plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, uh, I'll just quickly draw some trifoliates here. So you want to look at the top three nodes. So you, you count a node on a soybean plant by having three developed leaflets. So they don't have to be full size. But if you can see the three leaflets and all three leaves are formed and all three leaves are there, um, that is the top node that you count. And then you count that as one, you count down two, you count down three. So on the uppermost three nodes on that plant, we're looking for a small pod. And by small pod, I'm gonna say like three eighths of an inch long. So somewhere between a quarter and a half an inch long pod on those top three nodes. And those top three nodes are the ones that you look at to stage that soybean plant. So <clears throat> R2 is what we call full flower. So at R2, there's basically blooms all over the plant, but there's no pods yet. Or you might have some itty bitty little pods down at the bottom of the plant. As you get into R3, you start to get small pods on those top upper three or four nodes. Doesn't matter how big the pods are below that. You, you look at the top three or four nodes. So <clears throat> if you're finding nothing but blooms at the top, you're still in R2. When you start to find some small pods at the top, that's when you're in R3. And as those pods get bigger and bigger and bigger at the top, again, ignore the ones at the bottom. Doesn't matter how big the ones at the bottom are. We're looking at the top three or four nodes. As those pods get bigger, that's when you go R4, R5, R6. And then eventually, you know, you're looking at big full pods and you get into our seven, eight stage growth stage. That's where we're turning. That's when the soybean plants mature. But early in the season, when we're trying to make those fungicide decisions, we're looking for small pods on the top three or four nodes of the plant. And that is what you use to growth stage the soybean. So <clears throat> I would say the most developed beans I've seen are still R2. I don't think there's any R3 soybeans out there. Now I do know all right, Adam, Adam ran to the field and pulled me some plants. Good job, Adam. He's winded as well, so he was he was hustling. <clears throat> so, good illustration here. You can see this little this little tuft of 
trifoliates here, which is that are not fully emerged yet. So we don't pay any attention to those. We don't count those. Here's the first one we count. So there's the three leaflets. They're not full size. You know, they're not as big as those, but you get three leaflets. You can distinctly see the three leaflets. There's the petiole. So that's node number one, node number two, node number three. This plant isn't even blooming yet. So this plant still, this would be like a, uh, what would this be? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's like a V7-ish, V6, V7 plant, I would call it. So, so this plant is still vegetating. This plant, you could still spray Liberty on. You could still spray 2,4-D on. You can still spray Roundup on, you know, based on growth stage. You can still spray dicamba on it based on calendar date. We're done spraying dicamba on soybeans for the summer, unfortunately. But uh, I digress. So, so that's how you would stage that plant. So this plant is way too early for your fungicide. Now, could you put fungicide on this plant? Yes. I actually spray fungicide on plants at R1 sometimes when I'm looking for a little bit of yield enhancement. But I want to I want to have my main fungicide application at R3. This plant's probably, I'm going to guess, close to a month away from being in the prime stage for fungicide. So <clears throat> if you're in the application business and it seems like your summer never ends and your season never ends and you're spraying something all the time, you're right. So so that's a, a challenge that, um, that that those folks have to deal with. So this plant would be great for herbicide if you got weeds to control, not great for fungicide. Um, we, we need to let these plants get a little bigger, a little more developed. And that's when we get our biggest bang for our buck out of our fungicides. So, so I would say we are closer to the optimum fungicide application window for corn than we are for soybeans. And, and our focus on fungicide over the next few weeks actually should be on corn and the beans. We've got plenty of time to get that R3 fungicide on. And unless you're planning on making multiple fungicide applications in your soybeans, and I know producers should do. So if you're a if you're a three trip fungicide guy in beans, you've probably already made one. You might be getting ready to make your second. But if you're going to do it one time, which is kind of what's normal, and R3 is the is the sweet spot for that one time. Um, I, I haven't seen any soybeans that are at the R3 growth stage yet. <clears throat> so in the case of corn huge amount of debate and discussion about what the proper fungicide timing in corn is. And, and you cannot get widespread violent agreement on that. You can get different theories and opinions. You, you can have people that will tell you you should spray corn when it's shoulder high. You can probably find somebody that will tell you you still need to wait for brown silk. I say they're both wrong. And the correct time to spray fungicide is in between there. So our, our recommendation for optimal fungicide timing in corn, and it's optimal for several reasons. It's optimal because it's the right timing for maximum plant health benefits. It's optimal because there's no chance of, of uh, reducing ethylene production to the point where you inhibit ear development with the strobilian fungicide, because that still happens in some cases, even if you're not using surfactant. And it's early enough to get ahead of early developing diseases, and, and that would be the growth stage that we call VT. And it's called VT because it's tassel. So if you can see a tassel starting to come out of the top of the corn plant, that is the earliest we believe you need to spray your corn fungicide. The backside of this window would be R1, which is pollination. which is green silk. I've never been a brown silk fungicide person and the brown silk fungicide people have, have kind of been running for the hills in the last year or so because of tar spot and because the notion that tar spot starts early and tar spot is so insidious that you have to be ahead of it. We, we've gone from, I think, spraying most fungicide too late I think the pendulum has swung too far and we've now got too many people recommending fungicide too early. Now we like early fungicide in the V5 to V7 window 
for plant health, yield enhancement, and, and crown rot suppression. Nothing to do with tar spot or any other late season foliar disease. If you're talking late season foliar diseases, we're talking the, the reproductive stage applications from tassel time and later. <clears throat> we do still under certain circumstances recommend another application after that VT to R1. And if you want to be really aggressive with fungicide, you know, and, and I will have some acres of corn that, that get this, I will have a V6 followed by a VT followed by an R3 roughly. And there should be, I'm going to say no more than three weeks between those two. Fungicides have a fairly short residual. Even fungicides that brag about their long residual have a short residual. There is no fungicide that's going to give you residual control for a month. So what the fungicide does is it stops infection, it breaks the disease cycle, it kind of disrupts the, the disease progression, and then that has to start all over again. And before that can get up and going again to the point where the disease has recovered, so it's reinfecting and it's causing problems again, you know, three or four weeks have passed. And, <clears throat> and, and that's the, the protection that we get from that fungicide. It's not truly lasting that long. It's just, it stops the disease, kind of makes the disease have to reset and get going again. And what often happens is while that's going on, the weather changes to a weather pattern that's not as conducive to the disease. So what happened is the fungicide stopped it and then the weather changed to where it wasn't able to really recover and start over again. And by the time it gets going again, we're so close to harvest or maturity that it doesn't have time to do a lot of damage. So when you get what appears to be season long disease control from a fungicide application, that's not really what you're getting. You got disease control from the fungicide that lasted for a couple of weeks. And then the weather and the plant and other factors, you know, is what kept the disease from coming back, you know, later in the season. <clears throat> With a disease like tar spot and a disease like southern rust, which has the ability to be very aggressive still in August, that's why under certain circumstances, we might need that second application to give us that full season disease control. It's hard to say at this time how bad tar spot's going to be this year. There are people that are hoping because it's been hot and dry that there won't be any tar spot. That's probably an unrealistic hope. Uh, is there a possibility that we could see lower pressure this year than we did last year because it's been bright sunshine, warm, and relatively dry? Yes, that's possible. But uh, you don't necessarily have to have a lot of rain to have tar spot. You just have to have humidity. You don't necessarily have to have cool weather. It is not favored by high temperatures, but high temperatures alone are not going to wipe it out. And, and we have observed in years like 2018 in northern Illinois and 2021 in northern and central Illinois, once it gets going, it can keep going with less than ideal weather conditions. Now, <clears throat> if you want to be scouting for tar spot, and, and almost every day I get a report, somebody has found tar spot. I personally haven't yet, but there's probably some out there somewhere. I just haven't been looking in the right place. And the right place to look for it would be in your most mature corn, your most developed canopy, down low. So if you're going to find tar spot early, you probably need to be on your hands and knees crawling on the ground looking at the lower canopy. And you need to be in an area that's had probably, you know, at least normal amounts of moisture or possibly uh, higher than normal amounts of moisture. That's where you're most likely to find it first. Now, I did get a report yesterday. Some guys around Jacksonville feel that they've found tar spot in some fields. Um, some of the reports I had last week from Springfield area turned out not to be tar spot. Could, could be fly dew. So, you know, if you, if, if you lick that little black spot and rub it with your finger and it disappears, 
you, you probably just ate some fly poo because because uh, that you can if you moisten it and you can wipe the spot away, that's not tar spot. If you could scratch it off with your fingernail, that's not tar spot. So tar spot, you know, is can't be wiped off, can't be scraped away. Um, I've, I've had, um, you know, f f specks of fly do will look like tar spot. Uh, guy last week, uh, had a diagnosis of, he had some, some thrip feeding on corn leaves and where the thrips had been feeding and where their feeding stopped, there was a little dark spot that developed there on the leaf that was getting confused with tar spot. So there are a few other things out there that can look tar spot like. I'm not saying that there isn't tar spot out there. Even if there is some early tar spot out there, a VT fungicide application is still early enough to get ahead of it. So, so I, I, I know that the, the reason so many people are excited about maybe seeing tar spot this early is that that's kind of feeding into the frenzy that we need fungicide before tassel. I still don't think we need fungicide before tassel. I think fungicide at tassel would be earlier than some people have ever sprayed it before. So if, if you've been doing brown silk applications and last year you got burned because you thought that was too late, you're right, it was. But you don't have to go all the way from brown silk to V10, um, you know, which is about shoulder high corn. Just wait, waiting till that really early tassel stage uh, somewhere VTR1 for that for that main application. Talk about rate for a minute. If you are absolutely convinced, no matter what, there's no way in hell you're paying for a plane twice to fly across your field and you're only doing it one time, you should probably consider using higher than a standard rate. So almost every fungicide product has their standard recommended rate, which is generally about 50% less with most products than their maximum label rate. So for example, with Delaro and Delaro Complete, our standard recommended rate is eight ounces. There are people that will run 10, the maximum label rate is 12. <clears throat> so in my program up here, I'm gonna do eight ounces at VT, and eight ounces at R3, total of 16 ounces. If you're not going to do the R3, you should probably consider using a 10 or 12 ounce rate on that first application. Just something to think about. We do see a big difference in timing. We see a big difference in product we see probably a even bigger difference with rate and a big difference with coverage. So those are kind of the four variables that impact the efficacy of any fungicide and getting, you know, using a product that's effective on the disease you're trying to control would, would be job number one. <clears throat> getting it applied timely would be job number two. Using an effective rate would be job number three and getting the best coverage you can get, which is typically out of your control because you're not the person doing it. Um, but getting the best coverage we can get will, will help all those other factors as well. So any, anything else come in, Adam? <clears throat> yeah, a couple other follow-up questions um, pertaining to maybe Jordan and Drew's questions a little bit, but what do you think about uh, fungicide? When you're spraying your fungicide and insecticide tagging along, do we need to be looking for things yeah. to justify that? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question, and it's a question that gets people like me in a little bit of hot water from a from an integrated pest management standpoint. Um, you know, we, we are taught to not ever just willy nilly recommend anything, especially an insecticide. I mean, insecticides are are inherently more toxic than herbicides to you know applicators and and the environment and and other critters that are out there. So I don't take insecticide recommendations lightly. The, the challenge is e economically, um, there is good evidence to support insecticide hitching a ride with every fungicide application, especially in soybeans. Um, sometimes it's impossible to find enough insects to reach any sort of threshold. 
one school of thought is, well, if you've got five insects that are each at 30% threshold, uh, isn't that cumulatively over the threshold? I mean, th thresholds weren't developed that way. Thresholds were developed for, you know, each insect individually. So, so you could make the argument, especially at today's commodity prices, that, that established thresholds don't, don't really work to, from, a, from a purely economic standpoint. Uh, I've seen time and time and time again, uh, big benefits from having insecticide in with fungicide and soybeans enough so that I don't really ever recommend straight fungicide and soybeans. Um, every time I spray fungicide and soybeans, there, there is going to be an insecticide with that application. And, and there are situations, we've documented this in research trials, there are situations where you're getting a bigger yield increase out of the insecticide than you do from the fungicide in those applications. Having the two together increases your odds of getting a positive economic return dramatically. The same relationship probably exists in corn and in Northern Illinois, uh, using insecticides with corn fungicides to help suppress corn rootworm beetle populations is, is becoming more common. Um, the generally speaking, I would say in most cases in central Illinois, we're still using straight fungicide in corn, and there's not as much insecticide going out with those corn fungicide applications. My guess is there's probably enough of a yield benefit there to pay for it as well. Those, those insecticides are, are fairly economical. Most of the cost of the, of the trip is in the fungicide and the application. So it doesn't cost a lot to throw the insecticide in there with it. It doesn't cost a lot to put some foliar feed products in there with it. And, and that's how you end up with a $40 uh, corn fungicide program by the time you get done throwing adjuvants and a little bit of fertilizer and some insecticide and your fungicide in. And you're like, wait a minute, I, I agreed to an $18 fungicide. How in the hell is it 40 bucks? Well, you know, when you start adding things to it while you're there and it seems logical to do it while you're there, You've got that fixed cost of the application. You might as well put as many things on as you can in that trip. And, and each individual component makes sense. Each individual component makes economic sense. Corn's $6 plus, so it makes sense. And pretty soon you got a $40 fungicide pass. And you're like, that ah, wasn't what I signed up for. And, you know, and in my case up here, that VT followed by R3, I might make two $30 fungicide passes. So, you know, it, it adds up to real money. Um, you know, the reality is we got a $1,500 an acre crop out there this year. And, and in these current economic conditions, you know, it, it can be easier to justify doing lots of these things. When corn's 280 again someday, uh, we're going to have to revisit a lot of this stuff because 280 corn um, might not work as good with some of these recommendations as, you know, 640 corn does. So, you know, we'll, we'll kind of stay fluid with these recommendations as commodity prices uh, ebb and flow and the cost of making the application ebbs and flows. But, um, you know, it, with, with commodity prices where we're at, with the yield potential that most fields have, you know, it, it does feel like it's okay to be a little more aggressive with, with some of these practices chasing after maybe a little more yield than, than maybe you have in the past. But that's a personal decision and, and, and each of you will have to weigh the, the, the pros and cons of, of how aggressive you want to be going after a few more bushels of yield. So Lance, um, been having a lot of conversations. People, you know, we have generally some drier weather here recently. Right. So a lot of people are asking, do you think the fungicide efficacy is going to be as good as what it might be if we had some wetter conditions we're right. going into? Right. I mean, you just you just talked about yield potential and how things are looking pretty good mm -hmm. for the most part. Um, so, if we continue to stay dry, do you think we'll see the efficacy and fungicide? Yeah. So, so uh, it, hopefully, you all heard Adam's question because I, I usually don't repeat his questions, but sometimes he is harder to hear because he's not facing the microphone. But, you know, there, there have been questions coming in about, you know, as a general rule, when it's dry, uh, we see less of a benefit to fungicide than when it's moist. Um, par part of that could be the, the, the drought stress that the plants under. Um, 
affecting you know whether you see a plant health benefit or not and part of it could be the fact that under generally speaking under dry weather conditions we have less disease pressure so you can get yield increases from a fungicide two ways if you're using a strobe now if you're using a you know generic tilt or you know some cheap straight triazole you've only got one way to get a yield benefit out of a fungicide and that's by killing some disease because if without the strobe component there is no plant health benefit possibility so if you're using a product that contains a strobilier and fungicide, you can get plant health benefits that give you yield um, increases apart from disease control. And, and then you've got the disease control component. We, we see the biggest advantages to fungicide on average when there's disease to control, because you've got two ways to get a yield increase. You've got plant health, you got disease control. You can get a profitable yield increase from a strobilian fungicide without any disease, just strictly from plant health. But if you've got heavy disease pressure to go with it, like we did last year, you're probably going to see an even bigger bang for your buck. So Adam's question about the dry weather, you know, dry weather is probably suppressing disease development. In some cases, dry weather may be suppressing yield potential. And here very soon, as we get into pollination and, 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 and kernel set, continued dry weather will be suppressing yield significantly. So if you get in, and there are parts of the state that are, that are weighing these sort of options now, I mean, if you are terribly dry now, and, and some places are, especially as you go to East Central Illinois, uh, if, if you're dry enough now that your corn's rolling by nine o'clock in the morning, and you're thinking that if you don't get a rain before tassel, you may not have a crop. Um, and there are pockets that, that are that dry. You know, I probably wouldn't invest in a fungicide if, if that was my crop. Because if, if, you're, if you think you're going to be below your crop insurance level yield, all you're doing is really saving the government some money uh, as far as what they're going to pay you in a crop insurance claim uh, if you raise your corn yield from... 120 to 130 when your insurance guarantee is 165. So <clears throat> when it gets really, really bleak, I'm, I'm okay with, you know, shutting off the fungicide. Now, <clears throat> I, I don't want to give up on a crop. There, there are people that, you know, are, are known for, for the saying, you, you never give up on a crop. Uh, at some point, I do believe that you you start throwing good money after bad, as the saying goes. But but that point, I might get there earlier than some and later than others. That's a very personal decision when when you want to quote unquote give up on a crop. And, and if you decide not to protect your crop with fungicide, that that is you know in some sense giving up on your crop. Now that might make economic sense, might even make agronomic sense uh, at some point. Uh, but we're, we're not there yet, in my opinion. Uh, there, there is no crop in the state of Illinois that has been ruined. And if we have a you know, widespread three-inch rainfall event early next week, uh, everybody has pretty good yield potential. And, and some people have phenomenal yield potential across central Illinois. And, and so I, I think we still need to be prepared to make our fungicide applications. Um, that's another reason I like to wait till tassel, just to be quite honest with you, is, you know, if, if you're really dry at tassel and there are no prospects for significant rainfall in the next two weeks, I, I, I'd say don't waste your money on the fungicide. If you put your fungicide on at V10, when everything looked pretty good and things go to hell at tassel time, you can't undo that application you've already made. But if you weren't planning to make it until tassel time, that gets you closer to that reproductive stage of the crop. The further we get into the season, the easier it is to predict yield potential. And, and you, you, you have no idea at V10 you know, how good or bad your corn's going to be. You've got a better idea at VT how good or bad your corn's going to be. You won't know until later in you know, R4, R5, um, what your actual yield is going to be. And, and last year was a good reminder that we can get bad surprises even really late in the season. There was a lot of people that were, you know, eyeing that 260 bushel corn that turned into 215 uh, when that plant died about three weeks earlier than it wanted to. So, um, you know, the, the, the wheels can come off the bus uh, later in the season as well. 
but the closer you are to maturity, the better off you are able to predict, you know, how, how bullish or bearish do you want to be on your yield potential? And, and I still think that we get our best bang for our buck making a good crop better with fungicides rather than trying to resurrect a, 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 a crop that's failing. Yeah. Excellent fungicide conversation. If you guys have any more questions, make sure you're texting your rep, texting Lance, uh, chatting in here, obviously is always a good opportunity as well, but I think we probably got Everything wraps Let's, up on the questions that we've had so far, Lance. Okay. All right. Well, we're 45 minutes in and I'm like halfway through my list. So, so I don't think we're going to make it under an hour. Sorry, Jen. Uh, Adam, Adam knew you were going to be upset at us because we were going long today. <clears throat> but anyway, I, I, I tease because I love, you know that. So let's talk about corn rootworm a little bit. So you're, you're going to hear talk of corn rootworm out of Northern Illinois. Uh, I think Adam's got some pictures that I sent him we, we might show. Uh, I've actually had some calls on corn rootworm from closer to home. Uh, some pumpkin fields in Tazewell County are showing up with some pretty significant hot spots where we're getting uh, an elevated level of feeding and smart stacks. A uh, colleague of mine, um, yeah, Adam's got several of my pictures pulled up there, so I'll, I'll show a few of those. So, so we've had some some wind events and some root lodging. So, so if you're seeing, you know, you've all seen that before, right? Corn that's uh, lodged over. That isn't necessarily an indication you've got rootworm feeding, but if you have a lodging event, that's typically sometimes when people find rootworm feeding. And, and that's the case here. So when they went out and started digging up roots on those lodged plants, they were finding root systems that, now that's not a, you know, my colleague Jim Donnelly would say that's a pretty good root system. For Northern Illinois, that's a pretty low level of rootworm feeding. But for Central Illinois, especially what we've come become used to in recent years, there's one that looks a little more, a little more dire. There's probably more than a node gone there. So, <clears throat> so when you see those lodged areas in a field, might be worthwhile to, you know, take the spade out, dig up a few plants, wash them off. Now that was in a pumpkin field. Pumpkins are used as a, you know, if you're doing research on corn rootworm, oftentimes pumpkins are planted as a trap crop to entice rootworm beetles to move in and lay their eggs there. So rootworm beetles are very attracted to pumpkins, to the blossoms on pumpkins. They're yellow. We use our yellow sticky traps and soybean fields to, to monitor for adult beetles. So adult corn rootworm beetles are, are attracted to things that are yellow. And so that's one reason why, why pumpkins are, are attracted to them because of all the, all the blossoms. But uh, I've also had some reports uh, from my colleague, Austin Edwards, who, who's on our East Central Illinois sales team. Austin actually covers the, the area that is what I refer to as ground zero for the variant. So in that Piper City area, which has had rootworm issues and first year corn for uh, over 20 years now, uh, they've had some some real hot spots and some first year corn over there again. Northeastern Illinois um, has had uh, pretty heavy rootworm pressure in rotated and non-rotated fields. And then uh, the far northern part of the state, uh, once again, looks to have very heavy rootworm pressure in, especially in their continuous corn fields. Now, as you go west across northern Illinois, rotation seems to be pretty effective still at, um, at giving rootworm control there. But that's not so much the case as you as you drift east into that variant area. So it, <clears throat> in my part of, of west central Illinois, I think we still have relatively low rootworm pressure, but we might be starting to see some hot spots develop based on increasing pressure in pumpkin fields. Um, growers that have been raising pumpkins in, in that Tazewell County area in recent years haven't really seen hot spots, even following pumpkins. So, so it feels to them like, you know, things are starting to build a little bit. If you want to have uh, an indication of what you should plant on your first year corn next year, how your corn yields this year won't tell you anything about that. What you need to know is how many beetles are in my soybean fields potentially laying eggs this summer. If we can find beetles in your soybean fields, we need to assume they're laying eggs there. 
<clears throat> if we can't find beetles in your soybean fields, it's safe to assume they didn't lay any eggs there. So put some yellow sticky traps out in your soybean fields through the month of mostly the month of, of August. So late July through August is typically the time that we trap. <clears throat> and if you're not catching, you know, in recent years, we've had a hard time finding a rootworm beetle in a soybean field in most of my territory. If that's what you find this summer, I would be very comfortable using your double pro or tricepta, you know, on first year corn in 23. Uh, corn on corn, corn following pumpkins, totally different deal. That needs to be Smart Stacks or Smart Stacks Pro. And, and if you've got, if you feel you've got really heavy pressure, like Northern Illinois kind of pressure, it needs to be Smart Stacks Pro. Uh, we are seeing in our rootworm trials, doing some preliminary root digs, we're seeing some some really nice separation between Smart Stacks Pro. So as as I rate the traits of the marketplace today, you've got Smart Stacks Pro, which is at the top, significantly at the top. Really, the only thing giving a satisfactory level of control under heavy pressure in Northern Illinois. After that, you've got Smart Stacks. After that, you've got Chrome. And after that, you've got Duracade. So those would be the, the, the four options you've got today. Uh, there's a new option that we're coming out with called VT4 Pro, which involves the same RNAi technology that is in SmartStacks Pro. But this product does not have Herculex rootworm in it, so it's quite significantly different from this plant or this product. And uh, Pioneer is actually developing a Chrome plus RNAi stack, which will be out, you know, probably in a few years as well. So there's lots of things changing in, in the rootworm uh, arena. And, and these stacks involving RNAi, which SmartStacks Pro does as well, this new RNAi trait is, is really what's doing most of the heavy lifting in all these stacks. But to have good performance from RNAi, it needs to be stacked with a BT. So you will probably never see anybody selling an RNAi alone. It'll be stacked with one or more BT proteins to give that <clears throat> higher level of control. So keep an eye out for rootworm. I haven't seen any adults emerging yet, although there could be some out there. They will be emerging fairly soon. And I would say over the next two weeks would be the optimal time to be doing root dig. We're going to be doing root digs in a lot of our trials. We've got trials all over the state where we're comparing all these different rootworm technologies, looking for fields with super high pressure, fields with medium levels of pressure, trying to separate out, okay, where, where do we need SmartStacks Pro? Where can we still use SmartStacks? Uh, where does VT4 Pro maybe fit into the mix when that product's out in, in a couple of years. So uh, stay tuned on that. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, not trying to start a panic on rootworm. Um, most of you are not planting rootworm corn today. Uh, we sell more non-rootworm corn currently than we do rootworm. So I, I'm not necessarily saying that pendulum needs to, you know, swing back uh, the other direction aggressively. But we need to be vigilant on rootworm to try to get a one-year warning of, you know, when we do need to maybe switch back to using more traded corn uh, on first-year corn. We've really never quit using traded corn on the corn on corn acre and, and on the pumpkin acre. <clears throat> I will share with you, and, and again, not to be an alarmist, but, but those roots that I showed you a picture of, th those were smart stacks roots on, on a pumpkin field. So, so that's, you know, obviously more feeding than we would like to see from a trait protected corn. And, and that's the reason that Northern Illinois is aggressively moving to SmartStacks Pro because the BT traits need the additional help of that RNAi technology. And, and it is a step change in, in protection. Now, that being said, it is not bulletproof. It is not perfect. If you throw enough rootworm at a SmartStacks Pro hybrid, you're going to see more feeding than you would like to see in that too. So in addition to better traits, we need more crop rotation. We need adult beetle control. We need to do uh, kind of a holistic systems approach to rootworm management and not just 
throw a new trait at it and overuse the new trait until we break that as well. So RNAi is a very exciting new technology that I, that I think will be groundbreaking for people that are struggling to get rootworm control. But if the only thing we change and what they've been doing is a new trait, that's not going to last very long either. So uh, my, my colleague Jim Donnelly has the distinction of being, you know, from Northern Illinois. He, he's kind of known as Mr. Tar Spot and Mr. Rootworm. Uh, I, I argue with him. He needs to become known as Mr. Soybean. But but he really struggles uh, with getting some of his producers to want to grow soybeans in northern Illinois and, you know, white mold and you know 45 bushel soybeans. I, I, I get it. That doesn't sound very exciting to me either. But if, if you haven't had soybeans on a field in 10 or 15 or 20 or ever years, I really think you could raise some really, really good soybeans at least one time and kind of reset that root warm clock. So crop rotation continues to be our number one recommendation. Even if you're in a variant area, crop rotation still has a benefit. And most of Northern Illinois, you know, isn't truly heavy variant. It's just, it's just heavy, heavy, heavy pressure from years and years and years and years and years of continuous BT corn. Any questions coming in, Adam? Um, had a good question, kind of referring back to the drought that came in on text message. Yeah. Uh, we we're talking about, you know, our fungicides is probably going to be as effective and if we continue to stay dry. Uh, question came in, what about under irrigation? Okay. Yep. So so the irrigated acre is is totally different conversation. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I can envision a scenario where I would not be aggressively using fungicide under irrigation. And I will say this, in northern Illinois, uh, the irrigated acre are pretty commonly these days getting two applications after tassel. Uh, because in that irrigated environment, you're, you're doing two things. You're creating the perfect environment for disease, and you're creating, hopefully, the perfect environment for high-yielding corn. And if you've got the right environment for high corn yields, and you've got the right environment for disease, you've got the right environment to invest heavily in fungicide to protect that crop. So, so I would absolutely, no matter what the weather is, I mean, it, I, I, honestly, the, the worse it gets from a weather drought perspective, you know, the, the, the better the irrigated acre is going to look because you're going to have a yield there, but you may get the price that everybody's getting because nobody else has got as good a corn as you do. So, so I would say, you know, always, 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 uh, I, I would be willing to invest, you know, unless you've had significant stand loss or something tragic has happened to that crop to where, you know, you, you know, even with irrigation, you're, you're not going to have a good crop. Uh, I, I would still be, you know, willing to invest heavily in fungicides on on the irrigated corn acre. So good, uh, good question. So um, touch on a couple other things. Uh, so so we're in the um, we're in the time of year where where people are going to start to notice cut soybeans. Uh, you can certainly see a lot of burned soybeans. You can see a lot of wrinkled, crinkled, malformed soybeans. And, and not, you know, not everything is cupping and it can be difficult to, to tell different things apart from each other. Uh, I, I, would, I would say in general, just from casual observations, and, and this will sound like a commercial and maybe, maybe it is a small commercial, but, you know, if you just just driving around, the cleanest, prettiest, luscious beans um, are ExtendFlex. Um, you just see less leaf from leaf malformation in those. Um, that doesn't mean that everything that's affecting the other system is dicamba. Um, but you know, you can tell the difference between true real cupping and like a group 15 malformation. I was in a field the other day that had just some classic textbook pictures. I'll have Adam pull those up and I'll show you of what group 15s will do to soybeans. And group 15s would be your warrants, your outlooks, your ziduas. We are commonly putting those products in post-emergence, and we need to, to get additional residual on water hemp. So your pre-plant water hemp residual is not going to last season long. But if you overlay that pre-plant residual with some additional group 15, when you make that post-emergent application, I'm going to reach over and grab the picture that Adam pulled up here. 
That's a, uh, a very classic look at what I would call draw, draw string veins. Basically, those veins just were not able to elongate and grow. And that leaf gets that kind of almost a heart-shaped look to it. I think I've got a picture that, that's a little more heart-shaped than this one. But, but basically, that leaf just gets... You know, Adam's telling me to scroll here. So, so there's another, another look. That's a, that's a pretty classic heart-shaped uh, heart leaf there. So all that wrinkling and puckering and crinkling, um, none of that's cupping. None of that's dicamba. The, these actually are uh, dicamba-resistant beans. That's all from the post, you know, post-emergence application of a corn grass herbicide, which would be the group 15 class that we're using to get some additional water hemp control in soybeans. None of that's hurting anything. It's a little hard to look at sometimes. And I've seen it be pretty, pretty severe. I've seen it be uglier than this. And sometimes those leaves will kind of get tattered. They'll, they'll get a few holes in them. They'll kind of fall apart get kind of a ragged, uh, ragged edge to them. Um, there's another one. You can see some, some holes in, in those leaves, but that's all, that's all group 15 herbicide, uh, injury there. Uh, scroll through here and see if there's my potassium pictures. Ah, uh, here was a good one too. So this, this is back on weeds control here, but th this picture was sent to me. So thank you to the grower that sent that in. So that's a weed that, you know, a few days ago, he felt really good that that was a, a dead water hemp plant. And that plant's not as big as the one we were looking at here live in the studio earlier. And you can see the top part of that plant is smoked. But you can also clearly see some really healthy look of new growth coming out of the bottom of that plant. And, and in another week, that plant's going to be the same size that it was when it was sprayed. And in a month, it's going to be a four foot tall water hemp plant sticking up above your beans loaded with seed. And, and that, that's what we don't want to see. So you could get in there with another application and probably finish that plant off if you can get good coverage on it. And I see some other smaller uh, weeds there in the background. So there might be some other little ones that we can take out while we're there. But that's just another, another illustration of, of what that looks like. I'll show this one. Adam sent me this the other day. So, so just to just, just to be fair, dicamba misses weeds sometimes as well. So this this is what a dicamba miss looks like on on water hemp. And again, this this water hemp was was bigger than we would like to be. Um, there was no Roundup in this application. This was a straight dicamba application. And even though Roundup by itself is not going to kill that water hemp plant, I do think having Roundup in the tank makes dicamba work better. Um, and so I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of pulling the Roundup out of those applications. But, but those plants uh, are, are really messed up. You can see a lot of growth regulator type symptomology. Um, you know, a, a, a good shot of Liberty might finish that plant off in its weakened state. I wouldn't bet on it if it was mine. That's what I would do to try to kill it. That that's your best. That's your best and only legal option at this point. Um, and and that is one nice thing about that I like about the Extend Flex system. You know, it does give you the dicamba option if you're in an area that's your that's your safe to use it. And there are a lot of fields that we can safely use dicamba in. There there are people that could have sprayed dicamba this year that chose not to because they didn't want to deal with it, but their soybeans were surrounded by somebody else's dicamba beans or somebody's corn. And, and in that scenario, they're, they're, it's, it's easy to use dicamba in those fields. Yes, we've got heat you know, temperature restrictions, we've got date restrictions, uh, we've got things that we have to deal with. But, but I think at the end of this summer, when we see some of the limitations of the other herbicides to kill some of these weeds, people might be more willing to deal with some of the challenges of using dicamba because you're, you're, you you might have two options in some cases. You, you either deal with dicamba or you deal with weeds because without dicamba, it is harder to get weed control. Not impossible, but it's just harder. Uh, so there are trade-offs with everything. Uh, the, the system that is the most difficult to use is the highest yielding and most efficacious. So if you're getting better yields and better weed control, 
is it worth dealing with the more restrictive label? Um, the other point I like to make is if you're using Extend Flex soybeans, you don't have to use Dicamba. You just have the option to use Dicamba. So that's my favorite thing about Extend Flex is it gives you the flexibility to, to use that product if that's what you need or that's what you want to get weed control. Uh, let's see, what else do we have on our list? Um, oh, we, we didn't really touch on potassium. Pull that potassium uh, picture up. I, I did happen to happen by a field that was showing some really good potassium deficiency symptoms. So this is pretty classic textbook potassium deficiency. So, <clears throat> so the way to remember potassium and nitrogen, they're the inverse of each other. They're like mirror images. So if that was a nitrogen deficiency, which is what it sometimes gets mistaken for, you would have the middle part of the leaf down the midrib being fired yellow, turning brown, and the margins, the edges of the leaf would still be green if it was nitrogen. Potassium is the opposite of that. So the middle stays green and the outside edges of the leaves are what turn yellow and eventually turn brown. You see some striping in there too. That is the potassium as well um, because you're not going to get um, striping typically from something like sulfur in a lower leaf. You're always going to see potassium in the lower leaves because it is a mobile nutrient in the plant. So the plant is robbing potassium from these lower leaves to support the growth of the new tissue at the top of the plant. You most often, the most, the most common place I see that, two things is if it was ever a field that was in hay, especially if it was alfalfa hay, very difficult to ever put enough potassium on a field to, to offset what a hay crop is removing. And the most common place to see it is along the edges of fields, especially if that field edge gets mowed regularly. So if there's a fence there and it never gets mowed, you're not going to see that as often. And the reason I think mowing is a component of this is that grass that's growing in the road ditch or the roadside is you know, has a pretty extensive root system that is pulling potassium out of the edge of the field. And then you come along and mow the grass and you dump it in the ditch. So it's pulling potassium out of the field, mow it off in the ditch. Pull more out of the field, mow it off in the ditch. You never put the residue that you mow off back in the field. So you're constantly pulling potassium, pulling, pulling, pulling out of the edge of the field with the grass roots growing into the field. And then it gets deposited in the road ditch and there's no way for the corn roots to get back to it. So <clears throat> if, if you really truly are, are bothered by the edge of your field showing, to, and the other reason the edge of the field is bad too, because you know probably if your fertilizer spreader was spread into the middle of the road, you'd be frustrated at them for wasting your money fertilizing outside your field boundary. Well, if, <clears throat> if they're spreading to the edge of the field, you're never getting a full rate of fertilizer clear to the edge of the field. So if you want to fix that, so like along the highway where it's really driving you crazy because you're getting potash symptoms, find yourself an old drop cedar spreader. If you can get like a 10 foot drop cedar spreader and drive around the outside of the field and put on about 500 pounds to the acre of potash through a little drop cedar, just on the outside 10 feet, that, that'll fix that. Um, but most of us don't have an old drop cedar spreader or a way to do that. And uh, it's just really hard to get a full rate of fertilizer onto the edge of the field unless you're willing to fertilize clear over to the across the road to the other side of the road ditch. So just a few thoughts on uh, potassium deficiency. Dry weather drives that. So the drier it is, the more likely they are to see it right along the edge of the field. Um, most of the time in, you know, out in the middle of a, of a good field of corn, you're not going to see it. If you're seeing it more than just along the field edges or in an old hay field, um, probably need to do some soil testing and get with your fertility supplier to see what you need to do to improve your potash um, fertility or your potassium fertility. Uh, look at your base saturation. Sometimes base saturation will tell you more the, the pounds on the soil test because if you don't have enough potassium available on your, on your cation exchange complex, that plant's not going to be able to access that. And so we just might need, I think there's a lot of acres, frankly, that probably have more phosphorus in them than they need and not enough potassium. So potassium and sulfur are, are two of my, you know, big, big things I talk about from a fertility standpoint. 
because I, you know, I, I rarely ever see phosphorus deficiency. Frankly, rarely see nitrogen deficiency. Everybody talks about nitrogen and corn. It's almost always sulfur or potassium are the two nutrients that I see deficient most commonly. So we're uh, we're past our hour. Let's see if there's anything else on here that uh, is important enough to uh, to keep going. Pro probably not. So we can uh, we can kind of bring things to a close here. Any other questions come in, Adam? No. Nope. Nope. Okay, that's a clear that's that's a clear sign that the audience is ready for the episode to be over. They quit asking questions, so we will we will let it end as you wish. And uh, appreciate all the interaction. Appreciate all the questions. Think we had a great conversation today, and we will be back on July fourteenth. So between now and then is Independence Day. So everybody have a great and safe Fourth of July. Don't catch anything on fire. Don't blow off any fingers. Uh, don't burn yourself, uh, but uh, but have a have a good time uh, celebrating uh, our nation's independence. And uh, let's hope that that continues. So uh, everybody take care. Thank you.